Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Nick, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm Nick, Nick. And um, I'm beyond nervous right now to be here. And, um, and it's a new new thing for me, because usually I live in a state of fear and insecurity. And um, my sobriety date is 8719. And, um, you know, I think I got about a year and nine or ten months. I'm in that, that spot right there. And... Um, it's been an interesting journey, and uh, before I get into that part of it, I probably should think I'll tell you where I came from, and I kind of live on my, my background. So my background is I was born in Riverside in 72. I was born to two folks. They were hippies, and they were about 19 and 20 when I was born, and they were pretty footloose and fancy free, and drugs and alcohol and Free sex and all that stuff kind of ran rampant through <laughs> through those times of people's lives, and yeah, <laughs> totally ridiculous. And uh, my dad was a two-tour Vietnam War vet, and uh, he was at, at, at 20 years old, <laughs> and he was very damaged from that. My mom was uh, raised by brutally merciless, violent alcoholic. My grandfather Ed. Um, with her five sisters, and they're from the Dust Bowl, and they migrated out to California at some point in their lives. And so my dad's side of the family is New York, Italians, and they always stayed there. My great-grandparents on that side I knew very well, and they immigrated from Malta. My mom's grandparents I didn't know, but I knew my grandparents on her side really well. And alcoholism runs rampant in both sides of my family. Um, my mom's side of the family we were very close with as I was growing up. And uh, her, she has five sisters. Each of her sisters has four or five children. And we were all brutally and mercifully abused as children um, throughout and throughout the entire family. And it was just, uh, my mom was the youngest of five, of six. She was the, the six. She was the youngest. And then she, I'm an only child. And so... Um, that was pretty much my introduction into the disease of alcoholism was being dropped off at my grandfather's house and um, my grandmother. And he had been sober at that point when I when I was introduced to him, but he was kind of a dry drunk. He wasn't really hitting AA. He was just like just white knuckling it. And um, so that's that's my parents' backgrounds, you know. So we got the heavy alcoholism on mom's side, and I got my dad who's a PTSD drunk on his side, heavy into drugs, drug dealer. So for me growing up, I just, my life was split constantly between my mom and my dad. My dad was my idol, and he was this badass guy, he rode bikes, he was awesome, and my mom, I hated her. And, um, and there was no real reason behind that other than she kept me from my father. And so I was always angry at that. I always carried that resentment towards my mother that I couldn't see my father except every other weekend. And for some reason, she wouldn't let me see him. And when I saw him, he had all his money. He was a drug dealer. And so we had cars, we had dirt bikes, we had houses. When I was at my mom's, we lived in a fucking trailer that was you know, smaller than the one out here. And there was molestation and abuse in the trailer park. And all of these things I endured for much of my life as a young man. And, um, and that was my introduction into the world of alcoholism. And I dealt with that for a long time. Um, you know, as I get a little older, I'm, I'm always in a state of fear. I'm always in a state of insecurity as a young man. Um, I'm scared to be alone. I was, um, almost kidnapped a few times because I was always left alone. Um, it was like the last key kid. My mom was in college. She would go to college and just leave me on the corner. And then just she would pick me up if I was there. And if not, then the cops would come find me. And that was my first experience with the police. I was about five years old, getting picked up by the cops. And I was like, oh, well, these guys, they, you know, they pick you up and they take you home. And then I see my mom's face. And I'm like, oh, well, here comes a beating. So that was, you know, that's my, and she was drinking and using drugs and going to school. And so 
you know, like I said, there's like a lot of abuse in, in my story. And, um, and that segues into my, my youth. You know, my first recollection of drinking is about five years old. Um, my mom says I called her. I was drunk. I was at my dad's house. And I remember I remember this occasion. And I didn't have this, like, great experience with drinking. I didn't think it was, like, awesome. I just know that it made me feel the way that I didn't feel. And the fear and the insecurity was removed. I just felt different. I didn't feel great. I just felt not as bad. You know, like the, the bad feelings were removed and I was like almost like equalized. It was really weird for me. I hear a lot of speakers say that, you know, the, the euphoric feeling, they were like boisterous and they had all this energy and they could talk to everybody. But for me, it wasn't that at all. It was just like I could just maintain like not dying or killing myself was, was drinking and drugs for me. And and then most of the time I was on drugs for my youth. I started smoking pot when I was about five on my own. Um, I started doing cocaine when I was probably six or seven. Um, speed every so often when I was like nine. Um, heroin, stuff like that. The hard drugs, I didn't really get into that until I was about maybe 10. Um, you know, so really manageable life, you know, really, really the poster child for like manageability. And, um, and that, that carried on for a long time for me. And that was just, and that was just so I could live in my skin. Like the, this was just for me just to be able to, to get by. Like I didn't, I never liked drugs. I didn't like alcohol. I just did it because I couldn't stand myself. And I was so guilt ridden and like all the horrible things that were done to me as a child, being done to me as a child. It was just, it was just so much for me to take. And these, this just made me able to move through life. And, um, and the reason I kept doing these things is everyone in my, my family did drugs and drank. That's what everybody did. That's what my family did. I didn't know there was families that didn't do drugs in the world. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was families that didn't get drunk and beat the shit out of their children. I thought that was, I thought that was how life was until one night I was at my friend's house. I think I was like 10 and I had some joints and I spark a joint up at his room and he's like, whoa, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, I'm smoking a joint, man. Like, don't you want to smoke a joint? And he's like, my parents are here. And I'm like, oh, do they want one? And he's like, no, my parents don't do drugs. And I'm like, wait, you know, like they, your parents don't smoke pot. He's like, no. And so that was like, you know, one of these moments of like, okay, this might not be normal, but then I just keep moving through my life and I don't hang out with that guy anymore, you know, because, you know, that's just kind of how we, how we roll. Like, you don't act like this. We just kind of chop you out of our lives. Um, I was, I was majorly in fear of women for most of my life. I've, I've never really been able to, to, muster up the gumption to be able to talk to women. I was always really scared of people because I just didn't know what was going to happen in my life. And, um, and then I hit my teenage years, you know, like, you know, 13, 14, and I met these older boys and they were 16, 17 and they were in a gang. And, um, and I'm pretty psychotic as a child. I'm like, you know, like I just don't know anything. and I'm scared of everything. So they were acting out and I'm like, well, and I'm always on drugs and doing PCP. And so I'm hanging out with these kids and they're like, go punch that guy. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, we're going to punch this guy. And then, you know, go rob this store. Okay, I'll go rob this store or do a beer run in this store. Okay, you know, like that was my life, you know, as, as, a, as a young teen. And uh, I got jumped into this gang. They're a notorious gang in the West Coast. And I fought my way into this gang at like 12, 13 years old against men. And, um, and that's when the, the jail time start, started happening for me. And I started getting arrested a lot. Um, I spent every year in, in some sort of correctional facility for some fashion of time. And, um, but they'd always would lose the charges. They always would let me go. The, the, something didn't happen, nothing didn't make it, they didn't stick, 
And it happened time after time after time for me. And um, this has this has a meaning here later on. And uh, you know, I did. I think the longest term I did was about six months, uh, out of like the dozens of times that I've been locked up. And um, but I've been all the way through juvenile hall, and I've been on probation at least a dozen times in my life. And they would always kind of just be like, "Why do you keep coming here? Your paperwork's done. We don't need you." I'm like, "What's this?" You know? And they're like, "No, get out of here." I'm like, "Okay, but it's, yeah, I'm out of here." And um, and uh, so. You know, that's the kind of like was my life. You know, this this drug filled, drinking filled life that I led for the longest amount of time. Um, just maintaining, just so I could live in my skin. I wasn't always. I never recall any times of like getting drunk and having a good time, like being like out there, like having a party and cheersing friends. Like that's not my story. You know, it's like. It was just so that I could like sustain myself. It was was drinking and drugs. Um, you know, I was a chameleon. I moved a lot. So in moving a lot, I would just, as a child, I would just adapt to the situation around me, and I would kind of like water seeks its own level, and so I would seek my own level of you know derelict children, and I would just teenagers or young men, and I would kind of fit into that vibe. And, uh, and that, that was, that was, that was the way, the way it was for me for a long time. Um, I think the first time that I actually like had a euphoric experience with alcohol, I was like 17 and I remember this and I was at a party in Oakland and they had tequila and I took a big shot of this tequila and I felt this wave and this rush over my body that I not felt before or since. And um, I think I pretty much chased that for most of my drinking career. I immediately threw up afterwards. And then I immediately took another shot. And I think that was like the, I don't know, the, the, you know, the, the chink in my chain. I was like, you know, this is, alcohol is kind of the thing I want to do. I did drugs all the time. I never said no to drugs. I mean, I still did them. But, um, but alcohol was now my, the thing for me, there was this thing, it had this feeling, um, the drugs were the thing because it was so quick to hit my body that I could feel it very fast and I knew that it would equalize me. But all of a sudden at 17, I had this next step up thing. I was like, okay, this is something new. And so I started drinking a lot. I was, uh, I considered myself a drunk a binge drinker. I'd go out and I would just drink as much as I could. Anywhere I went, I would steal drinks at the bar. I would have a friend. We had a, we had like a system. We would take turns. We'd walk up behind you and talk to you. And as we're talking to you, one of us is walking up down the other side and taking the drinks and walking away. We had a lot of money, you know. And uh, at, at this at this time, I was living in Lake Tahoe, you know. So I lived out in Lake Tahoe and I did the snowboarding thing and. And all this time I was like into surfing and skating and snowboarding, but you know, the, nothing I could ever commit myself to, to really, other than the, the drug thing. Um, you know, and that was pretty much, you know, like that's, that's how I lived my life. I got in trouble, I got arrested, I went to jail. Um, you know, I, I heard of AA, I heard of NA, I heard of Al Anon, and I just thought that was for people that, that couldn't, manage themselves. And I was managing it myself. I thought, I thought I was sustaining myself. I was, I was not homeless. I worked, you know, I, you know, you know, I knew people in my life. I wasn't like ostracized from my family. You know, I, I wasn't living under a bridge. I wasn't drinking out of a paper bag. That's what I thought an alcoholic was. Um, I went to meetings with my grandfather that I mentioned earlier as a young man, I was like six, seven years old. And I remember going to AA meetings with him and they were really loud and it was really smoky. And I didn't know what that meant, you know? And I remember my aunts got into AA, you know, they, they're celebrating 35, 40 years respectively, a couple of my mom's sisters in AA and some of the other ones are Al-Anons. And uh, my mom is like a 30 year, 32 year Al-Anon. And uh, I just didn't understand what any of that stuff meant. And um, I remember being 15, and my mom was like battling with me and I was in a gang. And, um, you know, there's like, you know, 
a lot of violence in my life. I was a very violent young man. Um, guns, knives against other people played a big part of my story. And um, the fact that I'm not serving life in prison right now is just absolutely amazing. Um, I shouldn't be alive. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. And um, my mom took me after she picked me up from a correctional facility, and she took me out to dinner or to lunch. And I'm sitting there waiting for the beating that I normally would get after I got picked up from jail or a juvenile hall for my mom. And I guess she had gone to an Al-Anon meeting, and they said, take him out to eat. Blindsided. So she took me out to eat, and I'm sitting there, and she's like, hey, you're going to be who you're going to be, and ain't nothing I can do about it. And, and I'm just like, what is this woman talking about? <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, I was like, this is not making sense. It really, really caught me, caught, caught me unaware. And then I was, you know, I moved out at like 15, and I, you know, moved across the country to New York to be with my grandfather, and you know, just carried on my my drug field life. And um, all the stuff that I did, all the drugs I did, like I said, was just I just maintained manageability. You know, I was never, I never like died from drugs. I never died from alcohol. Um, I never like totaled a bunch of cars, um, anything like that. It was just, just kind of like, you know, maintaining. And then, um, about 24 and I got to go pregnant and that was my daughter's mother. And, um, we were in Colorado and I'm like, all right, well, you know, let's do another geographic. Let's go back to California. I know my mom's in Al Anon. I know that she hey, has a job, she owns a company, she'll employ me, this derelict son, drug addict, alcoholic that I am, not using those words, I just called myself a drunk, and, uh, you know, a druggie. And we go back to, you know, Huntington Beach, Riverside first, and Huntington Beach. And, um, you know, I start working with her, and, um, you know, I'm like, I never really knew who I was because I was always in this haze of alcohol and drugs. I was just, I didn't know who Nick was. Like, what, what was my deal? Who am I? What do I like? You know, I was like, you know, I was always, you know, like fear. I was always in a constant state of fear. My inventory, I've done my 12 steps, was insecurity and fear of everything. And, um, like I am insecure and fearful. Of speaking, but I'm here. And Regina asked me, I said, no. And then I wrote her back and I said, well, yes. So I had my daughter was being born. I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'm not going to be the parent that I was to my daughter. You know, I'm going to get sober on my own because I didn't know there was another way. And I, I quit doing drugs. Um, kind of quit drinking and um and it was like it was just my life was just manageable just barely manageable um that at least i thought i thought that was manageable you know looking back unmanageable that was entirely an unmanageable life as it says in in step one but i wasn't able to admit that i thought i was living a manageable life and you know for me that was manageability and so, you know, I got, I got sober for a little bit and then I went to Al-Anon for a year because my wife, she, she drank, you know, and you know, she was the alcoholic. She was the problem. That's nice. You know, and it wasn't me that the reason we were fighting. And this is, this is real shit. And, uh, you know, I'm still like drinking in the, in the bathroom and, you know, getting tall cans at the gas station and, and doing things like that. And, uh, but it's her, it's her, it's her problem. And that went on. I was with her for seven years and my daughter raising my daughter. And, and I used to say things like, I've never beat my daughter. I was proud of that. That was a, a statement I've made to people. I've never beat my child. Like, who the fuck says that? I said that. You know, you want to say, I love my child with all I can, or I, I give everything for my child, or I would sacrifice the world for my child. You know, with the things that I said, the way my mind was, I never beat my child. Um, I was proud of that. And uh, my twisted thinking, you know, my thinking is is really messed up. And um, an AA is like, you know, 
the thing that has changed my life. And I wouldn't be able to be where I am now without the help of AA and the people that are here to guide me along my way. And there's a lot of them. Um, so this daughter of mine, who I loved dearly, and uh, the wife that I was with, you know, that relationship came to an end one day. I left. And I just was... You know, for some reason, I don't know what it was. Like, I couldn't drink the way I wanted to drink. I just wasn't able to be the guy that I thought I could be. I just sat down with her and just said, I'm not happy anymore. I'm selling the house, and I'm leaving. And that pretty much was that matter of fact of a conversation that I said to her. And the next day, the real estate agent came out, and the next day, the house was sold. And I was in L.A., living in a one-bedroom house with seven guys, drinking and using drugs the way that I wanted to. Seeing my daughter every other weekend, if I saw her, and I was usually drunk or on speed. And then, and that's the kind of alcoholic that I am, selfish, self-centered, and um, that's me. And, it, you know, when I say these things, I'm glad that I've gone through these steps before I've done a speaking engagement because I'd want to kill myself for the, for the man I was to my daughter and to many other human beings that were in the vortex of Nick throughout my life. Because I abused men, I abused women. If you were around me, I abused you. And in any fashion that I thought necessary to get what I wanted to get. And... Um, so, you know, here we are, I'm 30 years old, and I am successful, and I'm working in video games, and I'm doing my career, I'm on drugs, and I'm on speed, and I'm seeing my daughter, and I'm damaging people, and it just carries on like this, you know, but I'm, man I'm manageable, still manageable, I'm working, I'm paying child support, I have a nice car. I'm um, living in Los Angeles. I own real estate. You know, you know, my alcoholism has confused me so much that I just don't know what is up. And then, uh, you know, we'll get to 35 years old. And at 35 years old, it progresses. It really ratchets up my drinking and drug use like really accelerates and um, vodka was my drink of choice and um, I'd go camping and it started off I would do vacations I go to Big Bear and I'd buy a couple big bottles of vodka and I would drink and go out and carouse and do fun things as uh, at least I thought they were and I wouldn't remember what happened and this just it progressed very quickly for me it went from like this manageable, drug addict, drug addled, drug fueled, alcohol fueled life to my life is basically off the rails. And I was driving drunk and I was getting arrested every couple weeks. I was in handcuffs. And then they would let me go. They would just let me go. They wouldn't arrest me. They would take me in and say, you're free to go, Mr. Fowles. It's like, what in the fuck is going on well i'm just gonna keep drinking and driving fuck it i'm gonna drink and drive in my brand new truck and i'm gonna rip all the wheels off so i hit a guardrail at 80 miles an hour cop pulls up oh mr fell got a ride okay we'll see you later i'm getting a car and i <laughs> fucking scot free those stories are just over and over throughout my entire life and uh like i said i should have been in jail not just that would not be a for life sentence type thing but there was other things and, um, and then I bought this ranch up here four years ago. And this was my drinking town. This is where I would come and get, well, I would leave LA drinking, drive up here drinking, and then continue to drink here. But this was my drink stop. I could come up here and drink like I wanted to drink all weekend and then get drunk and drive back to LA and then do my days of work, start shaking during the daytime on one o'clock and then I would be like I'm the boss so I gotta go something came up 
My mom died. My daughter died. My friend died. I worked at five companies in the industry I work in in the past 25 years. And at every one of these industries, I've killed my mom, I've killed my daughter, I've killed my pets. I've killed people in that I would fucking make believe so that I could drink like I wanted to drink. So, you know, I'm starting to get the, starting to get the hint here, you know, like I can't control my drinking and I'm like, okay, you know, like I can't control my drinking. I'm like 270 pounds, you know, and I'm going <laughs> to, this is funny ego. I'm unhappy with how I look is why I wanted to stop drinking. Not because I'm ripping the tires off my car, not because I'm damaging other human beings, but because I'm unhappy with how I look, how I feel about my weight. So I want to quit drinking for that. But my girlfriend at the time wouldn't quit drinking. So it's her fault. So I told her she should go to AA. <laughs> but, and it's fucking hilarious. And I didn't even know what AA was, you know, like I didn't know, but I'm like, you should go to AA because you won't stop drinking. And I want to quit drinking and I can't, but I didn't know that. But I was just using the other people as my scapegoat for, for what's going on. And then, you know, I let her go and get out of there. And then, um, I can't get a day. I'm by myself. I can't get one day sober. And, um, and I'm just drinking myself to oblivion. And then the alcohol stops working. Just, I can't get drunk. I'm pounding pint glasses of vodka, one after another, after another, and nothing is happening. I'm shaking convulsively all day. I can't go to work. I just can't get an hour of being drunk. And I'm going to blow my brains out. And I'm sitting there. And I scratch out a will. And I send my daughter a text message and say, I love you. And I send my mother a text message and I say, I love you. And right as I'm about to blow my brains out, God speaks to me. And God says to me, Nikki, call your cousin Jason. It's my grandfather. The violent, abusive one on my mom's side. But it wasn't ever to me. And... He was sober and went to AA, and I, I, I idolized him. And so I call my cousin Jason, and he's like, what's going on? And I'm like, I can't get a day. And so, you know, he tells me, well, Nick, you know, I got 22 years in AA. And I'm like, what does that mean? And he's like, well, what it means is, are you willing to go to any lengths to get sober? And I'm like, yes, I'm about to blow my brains out. And he's like, well, if you listen to me, I can tell you what you need to do in order to get sober. My sobriety is 8, 7, 19. I've been to a meeting every day since I've got sober, sometimes 5, sometimes 20, sometimes 30. Um, I've done H&I. Um, I'm constantly of service. I sponsor. I have a sponsor. I have a home group, many of them actually, because I don't let home groups go. Um and for me, that first meeting, I'm in this room, and I'm just shaking convulsively. And I'm like scared to death to come up here. And I meet Regina and Billy Bob in the Saturday meeting. And I meet some other folks that are up here. You know, I see Tony, and, and I think Jesse was there, and Greg, and some of these other people were up here. I met some of these folks up here in these meetings. And, um, and I could see that there was another way of life outside of my life. And so I've just been addicted to AA since that day. And my life is far better than it's ever been. If I would have asked for the life I wanted to live in sobriety, I would have sold myself far short of what I've been given. AA is a spiritual program for me. I have a God. It is not me. And if you want to remain sober, these steps, these traditions, are the things that do it for me, unity and service, they do it for me. And, um, you know, I, I feel blessed every day for my life. I feel very fortunate and very lucky to get to know the people I get to know. Um, I now get to live at my ranch, raise my animals, make video games for my career. I have a wonderful girlfriend, partner that gets to live her life and do her things. I don't get to shame her. 
I don't get to abuse her, and I get to you know, love her and care for these people in my life like I've never been able to do before. And it's um, it's amazing. And um, I think that's my time. So, thanks. Hey, I'm Rob. I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is January 6, 2011. Yeah, 2011. Um, my home group is Salmon Bay. We meet on Friday nights at 7.30 in Ballard. And I have a sponsor who has a sponsor. And I have sponsored people. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the basics of my, you know, getting to know me thing. Um, sorry, I'm really nervous right now. I was totally fine up until about 15 minutes ago. I was like, ah, um, so, um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, a little bit about my story and how I got here. Um, you know, it's, uh, I come from a long line of alcoholics. Um, and, you know, it, it's in my blood. Um, and I have, uh, two sides of my family. One side are 100% active drug addicts and alcoholics. And then the other side are almost all in recovery. Um, so growing up, like, I knew, like, I, I was raised in a dry household, and when I would see other families drink, and I would come home and ask why my mom doesn't, um, she would say, because we're all a bunch of drunks. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, she was, she would say that in hopes that I would not become one myself, that I would abstain. Um, but as a youth, you know, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what my parents wanted me to do. And I discovered, you know, substances pretty quickly. Um, I picked up for the first time at 12. And up until that point, um, at 12 years old, I was already diagnosed with clinical depression. And I was an early test subject for a lot of these uh, antidepressant treatments on adolescents. Um, I, when I first drank, it was like, this is exactly what they were telling me that these drugs were going to do for me. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, you know, I loved myself when I was you know, under the influence. I had, I was funny. I was charismatic. People loved me. And I rode that snake for as long as I could. Um, you know, I dropped out of school at 15, which it really didn't matter because I found other ways of getting by. Um, never went to college, always held just, you know, I, I have like what, 20 years retail customer service experience because I don't have any further education. But that was fine because I was getting all of my alcohol paid for. Um, that was like it. Um, for me, um, it was, it came as naturally as breathing in and out. Um, I never worried about when I was going to drink next because I always drank next. Um, and, you know, I, um, around, uh, around about 10 years ago, um, living down in Tacoma, um, you know, I, it became the, it hit the point where that was all I had in my life was getting intoxicated. None of my friends wanted to be around me and I didn't even be, want to be around me. Um, and I got into so much trouble that the Pierce County Sheriff showed up at my doorstep and politely asked me to leave the county. <laughs> um, and that's how I wound up in Seattle. And um, So that was, for me, the, the answer to all of my problems, is it wasn't me. I was just stuck in Tacoma, and there was nothing better to do. Um, so I moved up here. 
I got a job. I got drunk at work. I got fired from that job. I got a job bottling at a brewery. <laughs> and that was the greatest thing ever. Like, not only did it, not only was it free alcohol, but I could also now afford hard liquor. Um, like the medium shelf stuff, none of that, you know, $5 vodka that, you know, I was living off of. Um, and my rent was paid. Um, and, you know, that was, that was just fine for a while. Um, you know, because I was still able to mask the fact that I was incredibly lonely inside. Um, and, you know, I managed to get some friends up here, a bunch of people that, you know, really actually loved me for who I was. But, um, unfortunately, I couldn't love myself. Um, and that's, you know, and using was, you know, that was my comfort blanket, my girlfriend, you know, everything. That was my world. Um, and you know, something changed about five and a half years ago. Um, you know, I just, I, it didn't work anymore. That depression, like there was no more hiding it. And one day I decided to have one beer. Um, I've never, the thought of having one beer never crossed my mind. And at this point it was like 16 years of constant drinking and using. Um, and I had just one and I don't understand why anyone would just have one beer. Like, that that weird, like, crawling skin and, like, antsiness. Like, I, you know, I could only assume that everyone gets that when they have one because that's, you know, the only experience I've had. Um, at that point, I vowed never to try that again. <laughs> um, but... There was no more, there was no happiness in my life. And I kept chasing it. Um, then one day I decided to make this decision that like I was going to go to the doctor because I've been insured for like five years and never once used it. He took one look at me and was like, you're an alcoholic and you are dying. Um, my kidneys were barely functioning. My blood pressure was like 162 over 110, which is perfect for that of a small horse. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was about to have a stroke. And I was, I was 27 years old, about to have a stroke. Um, and two years later, um, I was still drinking, still using, still lonely. And, I'm talking with a drinking buddy of mine about how miserable I was. And he just looked at me and was like, well, have you ever tried not drinking? <laughs> and it just blew my mind. <laughs> it blew my mind so much that two days later, I went into my first meeting. Um, and that was November 6, 2010. Um, now, my sobriety date is January 6, 2011. So there was a little bit of a trial and error that first time. But, you know, that's been over four years now. And, you know, I love my, I usually love myself these days. Um, and that's because I've gone through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous twice now. The first time for me was a practice run. It was just to go through the motions, do them to the best of my ability, and get a glimpse of that healing. Um, about a year later, I started step one all over again, and this time with the clarity of mind that I had from going a while without you know, drugs or alcohol, I was able to do the steps again honestly. And, you know, and by do, in doing so, you know, I really 
like that that healing process was unlike anything that I experienced in my 18 years of you know drinking um and you know when I'm sitting down with people and I'm going you know I'm explaining these 12 steps you know the uh the 12th one the having had a spiritual uh, experience as the result of these steps like I I emphasize that the because if I this you know if I skimped on any of them or continue to I would not be in a situation where I can sit at home play with my cat and be happy and not have this gnawing thing in the back of my head that I could not escape um and uh you know and it's not it's not perfect i don't always love myself i don't always care about myself but compared to how i was it is a whole world different and so much better um and you know and there are you know i don't work a perfect program and there's things i really struggle with you know the third step especially having that faith that things will work out like that's like for me still like the third option you know first one's first one's still panic second one's still bargain third one is give it up and you know from what i've been told in time that does get better and my you know my life may not my life may not always be better on the surface things may still get rough things may be more difficult than i know how to handle but I am getting better. And that's uh really for me the miracle of this program. And you know, I that joy I feel when I'm able to sit down with someone and open that book and watch them get better is just such an unbelievable blessing. Um and uh Wow, I saw two and a half minutes. Um, <laughs> well, um, yeah, and, you know, just, uh, you know, for me, you know, like, you know, I'm calling out that third step because I've been dealing with that recently. And something that, you know, I've come to realize is like that, that prayer and meditation work for me as long as I keep doing it. Um, but I cannot take a break. It's like going uphill on a bike. You know, I tend to go, you know, please, God, thank you. Please, God, thank you. Please, God, thank you. And then I get to this point where I look around. And I'm like, look at what I've done. I am so awesome. <laughs> and, you know, I'll start to go back down that hill. But, you know, a few years in now, I realize that if I just start my every day with just please, God, and end it with thank you, God. I don't have to praise myself at the end. Um, so, yeah. Um, wow. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, but, yeah, and, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm nervous, and right now I'm also extremely grateful because, you know, there's so many people, especially here right now, that I don't honestly think I would have made it these four years without you guys. Um, and, you know, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shay. I'm an alcoholic. Okay. Did that work? Yeah. All right, cool. I've got all my tools because I've got a cold. So I've got water and a cough drop and Kleenex. <laughs> Hopefully we won't need them. Um it's nice to see you guys. Thank you, Jamie, for asking me to speak today. Um, I was told to dress up and not swear, so I'm going to do my best on the second one. Um, I was talking to a barista today about that I was going to be speaking, and, and I was kind of nervous about the whole not swearing thing, and was worried I might have like a sudden onset of Tourette's just because I was told not to do something. Um, and then he said... Uh, or maybe get some oppositional defiance disorder. And I thought to myself, like, well, 
I think most of us have a little bit of that going on because we're alcoholics, but he didn't know what I was speaking for, so I didn't say that. Um, my sobriety date is August 30th, 2011. I got sober in Olympia, Washington. I have a sponsor. I work the steps. I'm shopping for a home group because I just moved to Seattle in June, so um, working on all that. Um, it's been great so far, checking out all these meetings. I've never been to this meeting before, so hopefully I do the format right, but I'm going to tell you about my story. Um, I had like a pretty beaver cleaver upbringing, um, awesome parents and a sister. And I once noticed that when I, I hit about eight, I went from this like smiling, happy kid to like looking really intense all the time in my pictures. And I think that's for some reason, right about when the restless, irritable and discontent set in for no good reason that I can think of, but, um, kind of remember always feeling like I was in my will and trying to get more of everything and feeling like there was scarcity all the time. And most of that I filtered into trying to be perfect on the outside, like trying to have be a really good student. And I was an athlete. And so I got to like, those were pretty good channels for that. Um, until I found drinking at the age of 15 and I was pretty classic besides that restless, irritable, and discontent. When I started drinking, I had a very classic allergic reaction. And I may be not very classic because I don't know of anybody um, that has hangovers the way I got them. Um, from the beginning, I would I was like an eight in the morning, um, begin puking and do that for the whole day. And towards the end, it expanded to like three-day hangovers, whether or not I really got that drunk. Um, so it was a very obvious physical allergy and it wasn't, it was so bad and yet it wasn't bad enough to make me stop. What it did do was from the beginning, I also, um, was constantly trying to quit or control it from the very beginning. And, um, I didn't know that that's, I couldn't have told you that at the time, but I kind of, you know, had alcoholism in my family my parents were teetotalers. And so they, the first time they caught me drinking, they, they cried, both of them. And I've never seen my dad cry before. And they're like, I was 18 years old and I was um, going to all my recruiting trips, um, for swimming, which is like, you go away for the weekend and they just try to get you really drunk. So you have a good, a good time. And, you know, at this college and, um, so I was having a great time and, um, about halfway through my recruiting trips and they're you know, we're sitting at the dining room table and they're crying. And they're like, you have to promise me you'll never drink again at 18. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, definitely. Whatever you say, like, just stop crying and <laughs> we'll get through this. And then so I got grounded for the first time in my senior year and partied more during that time of grounding than I had my whole life so far. So um, even then I knew it was a bad, bad idea. And so it was like, I, you know, I had some other substances in my story and it was just like constantly like, I'll quit this or I'll do less of that or I'll only drink this. And, um, I also was taking psychology classes in college. So I would like try to cure myself and like think about all the different like psychological approaches I could do on myself or whatever self-help book I could find to like find the answers. Or maybe if I had a boyfriend, I'd like find his answers and I could focus on that. Find somebody, of course, who drank worse than I did so that, you know, I could feel okay about mine for a little bit, but the whole time the hangovers are happening. I swimming while hungover is the worst idea. There's no, there's no still point. You're like flipping and turning and like on your back, on your stomach, underwater. Like there is all your senses are heightened in a really terrible way. And, um, yeah, I had a couple coaches that were like, just don't come to practice. Like I can see and smell and like, you know, tell what's happening. And, yeah, didn't really slow me down. Um, so that went on for, you know, until it basically just got worse hangovers. Um, for a while, life expanded. Um, the reason I kept drinking, I guess I should mention that too, like, was that I loved it on, um, you know, the times that it worked. It was just Russian roulette. I never knew when I was going to get beat down with one of those hangovers. And so it was like, but apparently it was worth it enough to keep doing it for another 15 years. And, um, for a while, it made my life bigger. Um, I got to where I could go to parties and actually enjoy them and talk to people and um, flirt and um, just socialize without being so acutely aware of myself. And um, that was awesome. And it taught me, actually, I feel like it taught me some things. It taught me how to be that kind of social person. And, you know, even out of college, like to go to work events, which apparently 
at least the field that I was in for a while, like the the auctions or the fundraisers, or whatever, that was like the adult excuse to get wasted in public. You know, like they're all in their business suits and doing their work thing, handing out business cards, meanwhile getting free drinks and open bars and all this. And I was like, oh, okay, this is how we do this now. And um, it, it, it was, it, I got to learn how to network, I guess, drunk. Um, and then, so that went on for a little bit, but then I, pretty quickly after I got into the professional world, my life started to shrink. Um, and I think it was mostly because of the drinking, um, the drinking, not more solitary. I was in new cities, couldn't figure out how to build a life there to save my life. I mean, like I was, you know, showing up and trying to make coffee dates with new people and trying to like build a life in the city. And what I really would end up doing is like one of my favorite things was to buy a bottle of really cheap champagne and a pizza and go home and drink the whole bottle of champagne and eat the whole pizza by myself which is really an amazing feat now that I think about it. Like that's a lot of stuff to imbibe for one person. Um, and it wasn't very much fun by then. Um, and so I did my favorite experiment, um, at trying to c control my drinking was I'd gone to Mardi Gras a couple of times and I had beads, you know, from new Orleans, legit beads. And, um, I'm a clean freak. So I threw them all over the floor in my bedroom, all over the floor, all the beads that I had uh, earned. And, um, <laughs> I was like, okay, for every day I don't drink, I'm going to put them in this stein I had from Oktoberfest. I never thought about that. <laughs> so eventually my floor will be clean again. If I could put like, I don't know, it was maybe two weeks worth of beads. Um, if I could just string 14 days together, my floor would be clean again and I wouldn't wake up and step on them and, you know. I never did it. And so I'd start over. I'd empty the beads back on the floor. And like, I, thought I only made it a couple weeks of that before I was too annoyed with myself to, to try something else. But that is one of, you know, dozens of different little plans I had to cure myself. One of them in entailed going to treatment, um, which was awesome until I went to an AA meeting and thought everybody was just like totally had drank the punch. You guys were way too happy for me. And, um, also, a really old man hit on me after that meeting, which was a great resentment to be like, this is not a safe place. You guys are crazy, and I'm never coming back. So instead of doing that or following any of my discharge plan, I fell in love and got into another relationship, and that was a great distraction. So I was, you know, was off to the races again. Um, forgot about that whole, like, treatment problem with drinking thing that I'd convinced everybody in my life, like, sober is the way. Another thing I did that first time around, I made it five and a half months, and I um. What, I, I used to smoke blunts and drink margaritas. So what did I do? I bought cigars and got lemonade Gatorade and put salt around the rim. I was like, I'm totally sober. This is fine. Like, I hate these cigars, but it's as close as I'm going to get. So, um, yeah, that was kind of as close to sober as I got until um, about – Four years ago, I had convinced myself that I was crazy and that that was my problem and diagnosed myself. Um, and I actually have the education to do that, not to myself, but to other. And so, like, I went into this therapist and, like, laid out my, you know, here's what I am. And he's like, oh, yeah, you are. You're totally this. Um, you know, let's get you on medication. And so I go to the psychiatrist and I answer his questions. And his he was a resident. And so the psychiatrist comes in and he's like, yeah, you're not, you know crazy. You're an alcoholic. <laughs> and like the next thought that I had was actually probably the most poignant thing. It was oh, shit. I'd rather be crazy and take some pills than have to deal with what you're telling me right now. And for some reason, what I consider to be a miracle, I, well, first of all, whatever I said, I must've been more honest than I'd ever been. I don't know what I said to him that gave them that tip, but also I stopped drinking after that. And, um, for about two months, I saw a therapist and I was like, I had torn down my life again. So I was living in my parents' house. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a job. I was just being a cool 30 year old in my parents' house. And, um, then my therapist was like, you know, I had no friends. I had, you know, I'd kind of burned it all down. And he was like, you're on a lonely branch right now. You know, you might want to go to AA. There'd be some other people that are doing what you're doing. And, you know, you might have some friends again or meet some people that are not the type of people you've been associating with. And so I did it only for that, only out of loneliness. And, um, but I was as willing as the dying and I had done so many plans for 10 years. I was so full of plans for so long that I was sick to death of myself. And that was the key of willingness for me. And I 
the first meeting was like this I'd heard about from the one sober person I knew who had moved to California. She had told me about this women's meeting that went to different living rooms. Like they rotated around and I was like, yes, that's my meeting. Cause I, you know, I don't do churches. And, um, so she emailed this chick who emailed another chick to see if I could come. And then she picked me up at the farmer's market and drove me to the meeting like that. I needed to be literally hand delivered to AA because I was too afraid to get there on my own. And, um, it was a sunny day in the summer and we sat in the backyard and drank like lemonade and there was dogs everywhere. I'm like, Oh yeah, this is pretty sweet. And I had no idea what the hell they were talking. Oops. There's one. <laughs> I had no idea what they were talking about, but they were really nice. And they told me which meetings I should try later in the week, which of course I didn't do. Um, but you know, as uh, the weeks went by, I, I checked out like the one meeting and, um, eventually, uh, got a couple in there and I had about three months and I went on a trip on a, like a floating boat on Lake Shasta where uh, there was 30 of us. And it was just, of course, a drunk fest for everybody that was there. But there was one guy on the boat who had 30 years sober, who was my little angel for that trip. Um, but I ended up throwing my back out in like the worst way I ever had in my life and going to the doctor, couldn't walk wheelchair status. And she's like, and I'm allergic to opiates. And she's like, well, I'm allergic to all drugs, let's face it. <laughs> I'm really allergic to that one. Um, she's like, well, I can't prescribe you um, marijuana, but you should probably smoke some marijuana with the opiates for your pain. And I didn't have a sponsor to run this by. I was just like, oh, this doesn't, oh, I don't know. But I know how to get that. Like, I know how to make that happen. <laughs> so um, for about a week, I was trying to, like, smoke as prescribed and take my medicine. <laughs> Seriously, like, yeah, I won't go into it, but I had a plan, right? And um, and then I reset my date and got a sponsor and was glad to be out of that land and be clear-headed again because I didn't want to go back. And from there, um, I got to work the steps with a sponsor who was great. I made it to step six. Um, became very apparent that I needed to switch sponsors. So I got to start over again and I made it to step nine and I had to switch sponsors again, start over. I don't recommend that. So, uh, made it to the work with my sponsor now and we made it through the steps and I was one of those people that took forever to do my fourth step because I had collected a fair amount of resentments and I balked like crazy through the process and took eight months to do that. Don't recommend that. It was, I was so crazy. It was fascinating. Um, just really had to roll around in that stuff, but it was good because like I told you guys, I'd been that straight A student and I'd had to do everything perfectly up until then, except for drink. I wasn't very good at that, but, um, I I've gone through this in a messy sort of way and that's been what I needed to do, but I've gotten so much freedom from it. And I'm doing the steps again with my sponsor and I feel like, you know, you get sober, you do the steps and you build this foundation in sobriety and you build a house and um, then you do a, the steps again and it's remodeling, which is, can be a pain in the ass because you still got to use the kitchen, but like, you're like trying to redo the walls and everything. And um, it's just been amazing to watch my world grow again. I hadn't had that since those first couple minutes or months or maybe a year of drinking. And now I'm in a program that I get, you know, like the limitless load. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. If I mine it, if I keep showing up and saying yes and stay willing and stay without my plans, leave those plans at home, um, my life keeps getting bigger. And I don't know of any other way to do that. Um, I would have found it if I could have. And I have a sponsor who's the most free person that I know and they give that to me. They're showing me how to live that way. And, you know, I, I don't really even know how to show up in the world this happy. Um, it's kind of awkward and embarrassing sometimes how cheerful and present I am because I was always very good at being restless, irritable, and discontent. I know that role, like, but it's just less interesting me these day, to me these days. And I have another option and um, that's through the steps and, um, through just getting to show up at places like this without any schedule. I don't have to organize anything with anybody I can just show up here and I see a room full of people that are, have what I want and are real and honest and uh, willing to show me how to do this so that's it thanks Thank 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.